As I'd like to call this committee the board meeting of April 14, 2022, to order with adoption of the agenda. Uh, so I want to make that motion for me, Councilor Ryan, Councilor Brooks Hill. All in favor? Motions carried. Adoption of the minutes from the Committee of the Whole of March 10th. So I want to make that motion, Councilor Brooks Hill, Councilor Palmer. All in favor? Motions carried. Special Parks Master Plan Committee of the Whole meeting minutes of March 15th. So we'll make that motion, Councilor Brooks Hill. Seconded by Councilor Ryan. All in favor? Motions carried. And the Special Budget Committee of the Whole meeting minutes of March 15th. Councilor Brooks Hill, Councilor Ryan, all in favor? Thank you. Any business arising from the Committee of the Whole of March 10th? Seeing none, any business arising from the Special Parks Master Plan Committee of the Whole? Councilor Palmer. Um, I believe that that is now out for public comment. So just. Okay. Yeah, so that'd be good for uh, public to take a look. Perfect. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. And then any business arising from the Budget Committee of March 15th? Saying none, we're going to move on to delegations and presentations. We have people here for BC Transit. Is that correct, Mr. Black? Yes, it is, Your Worship. And uh, Aaron Sparks and uh, Seth Wright from BC Transit are on today. And uh, I believe Aaron's got a very short presentation for us today to talk about the findings of our uh, last public outreach. All right, carry on here, thank you. Great, thank you very much for having us here today. I am going to share my screen. And... Do people see a screen that says Transit Future Service Plan? Yes, we can. Or am I sharing, is it like a start of a presentation kind of looking screen? Yeah, yep. All right. <laughs> it's always fun when you're doing this remotely to make sure you're sharing the right one. All right. So I will get started. There we go. So um, just to start off with sort of the transit vision. So this Transit Future Service Plan outlines the vision for transit in Revelstoke. So transit uh, is the preferred choice for residents and visitors alike, attracting riders through comfortable, safe, accessible, and convenient service. The priorities in this plan reflect feedback that we received through stakeholder workshops, uh, as well as through public engagement. And these proposals will help to grow ridership by responding to community needs, by providing increased opportunities for Revelstoke residents and visitors alike to explore the city by bus. And I'll just note before I get started, there's numbers up in the top left-hand corner of the screen and they correspond to the numbers in the full plan, which is in your agenda package. So if it looks like I'm jumping around a little bit, it's just because I've taken some slides out for the sake of time. <laughs> so moving into transit needs. So service levels in Revelstoke have remained pretty steady in recent years with the most recent service change occurring in 2015. There were some minor changes made in 2020, but we uh, just to some, some routes, but we kept the service levels the same. And as you can see in the map on the right, transit is provided in the most densely populated parts of the city. And I'll note here that the density information that's presented in this map is from the 2016 census, um, just because we weren't able to access the more recent data. But as Revelstoke continues to grow, BC Transit will work with the city to ensure that transit is responding to community development patterns. Just want to touch briefly on system performance. So transit ridership in Revelstoke has remained steady over the past few years, of course, before dec decreasing due to COVID-19, which is what we saw in transit systems across the world. Um, these two charts show ridership at the system level. So annually for fiscal years at the top and then monthly at the bottom. And I'll just flag that the, the chart at the bottom displays April 2019 to March 2021, um, but ridership has continued to grow since, since March 2021. That's just where the, the graph ends. So we're not back to 100% of pre-COVID ridership, but it has continued to recover. In terms of public engagement, so uh, engagement spanned for one month from January 8th to February 8th, 2021. 
Because of COVID, we conducted our engagement substantially online, but we did have some paper surveys available uh, on request. And so you can see that we did have 14 people who did uh, fill out the paper version of the survey. We also held a pre-COVID in-person workshop in February of 2020, which was used to determine the priorities that ultimately were presented to the public during the main phase of engagement. This map shows the future transit network. So with all of the, the new routes and modifications to existing routes that we are proposing in this plan. Um, so it's, there's a lot going on, but there's a, a couple of different items that are highlighted on the left. So the extension of route to Columbia Park, the route uh, one south side being split into two separate routes, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, a new route just for Arrow Heights. And then of course the new route six for uh, Revelstoke Mountain Resort. So I'm going to just quickly highlight a couple of the key proposals in the, in the plan. So this is one of the short-term proposals that we are putting forward. So this would establish a new BC transit route between downtown Revelstoke and the resort. Through this priority, the existing Everything Revelstoke shuttle would be assumed by BC Transit. This service will support community growth by providing transit service to Revelstoke Mountain Resort, as well as the surrounding area as it continues to develop. This priority will provide a link between the city and the resort, connecting residers, residents and visitors to amenities, recreational opportunities and accommodation. Um, other short-term priorities, which you'll see in the, the full plan, include an extending Route 1 to Mount Cartier Court, as well as the introduction of Sunday service and evening service. Moving into some of our longer term priorities, I'm not gonna to touch on all of these, just highlight uh, a couple of them. So the key priorities here are the splitting of route one south side into two routes, creating a new route for Arrow Heights, and then also extending the area of coverage on route one. Uh, and you'll see that the resource requirements are combined for, for those priorities, just because they will be implemented at the same time. And then we also have the extension of route two and route three. So in terms of investment strategy, to achieve the goals of this plan, capital and operating investments in the transit system will be required over the next five years and beyond. This plan calls for an additional 8,150 annual service hours, as well as five additional vehicles. Service improvements will be integrated into our three-year transit improvement process, which is updated on an annual basis and guides how expansions are implemented across BC transit systems. Through, uh, through this improvement process, the priorities outlined in this plan will be costed and presented in a memorandum of understanding to Revelstoke Council for approval. Once these priorities are approved, we will proceed uh, with the request to secure provincial funding, uh, the funding that's required to implement these priorities. And I'll just, the other thing I'll maybe say here is that through, through this process, local governments commit financially to their first year of expansions subject to the confirmation of provincial funding. And then the items that we present for years two and three are presented just for budgeting and planning purposes. And we do recost these items annually. In terms of next steps, uh, we're, we're here just recommending that the city of Revelstoke accept this transit future service plan to be the guiding document for transit improvement in Revelstoke over the next five to seven years. Uh, and so we can integrate these proposals into our expansion and service change planning process. And so that is it for the presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions. There we go, to stop sharing. So thank you very much for allowing us to, to speak to you today and happy to answer any questions. Good, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions just uh, right off the bat. Just going to move through to going up to RMR. What happens with our existing shuttle buses? Are they amalgamated into BC Transit? Uh, what happens there? Mr. Black, <laughs> thank you, Your Worship. Um, quite honestly, I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do with those buses, as they are the the, the uh, equipment by uh, the uh, shuttle service itself. Um, and as Aaron described, we're looking at bringing in full-size coaches for this, not the uh, smallest vehicles in the BC Transit fleet as uh, we currently operate. I know the existing buses, I believe, are what, 30 passenger, roughly, buses. And so we'll be looking for some bigger coaches. Um, I'm not certain, again, what the disposition of those uh, existing buses that uh, the shuttle runs. However, we can certainly find that out in the future. Um, 
the big picture here, uh, council and mayor, is that uh, the equipment, uh, if we're working with BC Transit on this, is BC Transit equipment, and we do benefit from the buying power of the province and all of the equipment in addition to the, uh, the cost sharing agreement. So it is a real value to the community. And I believe that uh, we're on the average of about 25,000 passengers a year on the BC Transit service. And we'll go into the hundreds of thousands of passengers when the combination of these two um, operations are consolidated. So a very good um, value to the community and the big picture. Any other questions from other councillors? Councillor Sherlock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, sorry, I can see the sound there. Speak to the weird place. A um, couple of questions. So, for the larger heavy duty units, uh, can you? I'm not sure if I've I'm familiar with which bus you are talking about. Can you just describe a little bit about what kind of equipment? Um, passengers would be able to take on board. So I'm thinking obviously for the ski equipment for going to the resort, but then also in the summertime, one of the, concern, one of the challenges we've had is putting bicycles on board um, with the smaller buses. So I'd like to hear what the possibilities are. Um, Aaron, if I might ask you to uh, talk to the uh, equipment that BC Transit would typically use for this sort of uh, operation. And then I can certainly talk to the uh, um, recreational equipment that needs to be transported. Uh, yeah, so with respect to equipment, um, we would be looking to use our heavy duty, so those are our 40 foot buses to run the, the Revelstoke Mountain Resort service. In terms of storage options, we have in the past explored kind of various options for the storage of skis, snowboards, um, I believe, uh, Oh, what is it? Uh, surfboards <laughs> at, at some point as well. Um, and through the, the various explorations that we've done, we don't currently support any internal or external storage options just because we found that um, external mounts tend to block with, with our fleet type, the external mounts tend to block emergency exits. So there's a safety concern associated with that. Um, and we don't really have any viable options other than that, and so with our existing um, services that go to ski hills and other parts of the province right now, passengers do have to take the skis and the snowboards on board with them, um, just because we don't have any other um, supported options for, for storage. Right, okay. And as far as uh, bicycles, uh, the bike racks are pretty common on uh, equipment and so uh, putting bike racks on the front of vehicles is pretty normal and there have been used successfully in the lower mainland with TransLink and I'm certain in many other locations that BC Transit operates and so we can certainly accommodate uh, the equipment either inside or outside of the buses. So okay great thank you. I need one of those bike racks that holds like 20 of them hanging off the back of that bus I, I like this image already, Aaron. This is going to be cool. Councillor Elliott, a question. Uh, just uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, you said the big traditional buses that BC Hydro will be what we would what would be rolled out here in Revelstoke. Is there any move to electric buses or greener options uh, that you guys are considering? Aaron, I, I will defer to you as far as what the, the fleet makeup is looking like in, in BC Transit's future, but I think that the answer is absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, will, yeah. I will subsequently defer to Seth Wright, manager of government <laughs> relations. <laughs> yeah, through your worship to, uh, to Mayor, or to Councillor Elliott, um, we are excited about our battery electric bus project. Uh, BC Transit has ambitious goals to be a totally electric fleet uh, within the next decade or so. We're right now doing an engineering assessment of the entire province to identify where 
where we want to uh, put those early adoption buses um, and the technology is rapidly evolving in the transit world. Uh, the bus type that we're talking about implementing into Revelstoke would be a 40 foot conventional heavy duty bus. That bus type could be swapped out for a battery electric bus when we have the infrastructure ready in Revelstoke. So I, I can't give you a timeline or, or when that's gonna be, but um, we do have a plan and we're working away with our engineers to, uh, to implement that plan to uh, electrify our fleet. Follow up, Councillor Uh Yeah, I mean, uh, a 40 foot bus, uh, uh, I mean, we do get a lot of snow. I, I, I'm just wondering how practical to get a lot of people and move them efficiently in, in, in the winter with a, you know, we get a big snowfall. I guess you've done it in Whistler, but uh, they might have a better plowing program. I, I don't know, but uh, it's a concern for, <laughs> concern for us. If a big bus doesn't, doesn't, it's not that mobile and it's not, uh, maybe our streets are not designed effectively for it. I think they're going to be much bigger than what we've got now, maybe another 10 feet, but you get 10 feet and another 10 people on there that should weigh it down enough that they can get through the snow. And if not, you've got 40 people or 50 people on there that can push your cars up. <laughs> anyway, Councillor Sherlock, you have a question. Sorry, Rob. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Worship. So, Following up on that then with the battery buses, that's exciting to see that com continuing on. I remember seeing at the transit workshop um, in Kamloops before the pandemic hit, uh, some of the visioning and ideas of what was coming from BC Transit. So it's exciting to see that coming into fruition. Um, you mentioned infrastructure for those battery buses. And I imagine with the pilot projects that you were talking about, you're figuring out what that inf those infrastructure needs are. Um, I'm asking, I'm curious as to what you do know so far, because one of the questions with our transit system is uh, whether we continue to use Grizzly Plaza as the uh, hub and switching spot for the buses. So I'm curious as to how those big buses will fit through there and what information we can take back to uh, another committee we have going on right now. We're meeting next week for the Grizzly Plaza revitalization. Um, so we're looking at shifting the, to make the space more functional. And I'm really curious to hear from BC Transit's point of view is how does the functionality of the plaza fit in now and in the future? If I, if I may, Councillor, uh, through your worship, um, we, are, we have not yet determined what the final configuration of the route would look like. Um, there is going to be some concerns with large equipment using Grizzly Plaza in the future and perhaps um, uh, having given a little bit of thought to this, that um, the southbound route would be on Victoria because the bus doors would open on the uh, sidewalk side um, versus coming up Victoria northbound, which would put people over by the tracks and not a very safe place to drop. So we'll have to figure out the northbound route and that may be First Street bypassing the plaza itself. And then we could be dropping people um, in a in a urban area with sidewalks and and uh, place, safe places to be dropped and picked up. Um, however, again, we have not figured out the, the full detail of that. And obviously the configuration of Grizzly Plaza will play into those discussions in the future. Um, I know that our operator of the shuttle has um, played with some timing and um, uh, operations of, theoretical operation of a system using Grizzly Plaza as the center of uh, the universe, so as, I, as we could say. And um, with two buses traveling eat, um, in opposite directions but meeting at Grizzly Plaza, he believes that we can operate a pretty efficient system that uh, um, would not require significant new hours above and beyond the combination of the shuttle and the transit system. But again, preliminary looks at these things. And um, I think the, the key walk away from my perspective to council and the community is that um, we're, we're acknowledging the combination of the systems is going to be a benefit to the community. And I believe I've been talking to this for a few years and it's nice to see that the community is coming to the same place as um, staff 
And um, it's very exciting for us to look at going from a very, very small system to a system that is significantly larger with significant benefit and operations and significant ridership, which is, I think, a goal of, uh, at least for what I've been hearing from council in my time here is, is a very important aspect, um, not to be having so many empty buses running around, but to have a, a, a fleet that's utilized at a high, much higher level. And then Councilor Ryan. Uh, thank you, Steve uh, and uh, Aaron. Uh, just a question on, uh, I know the vision was, is pretty grand about uh, increasing the ridership, but what kind of strategy do you have in place to, to, to make that happen? Uh, I mean, the dollar speaks and people have to have some kind of incentive to really get on the bus. Uh, that's, that's the reality. I mean, do we need to start thinking about charging for parking and uh, increasing road taxes and those type of things to make ridership uh, 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 to attain the vision that you have in place? Um, through your worship to Councillor Elliott, um, uh, carrots and sticks are, are obviously the very important aspects of any successful transit system, parking system, um, mode shift that I think we're all looking for um, in, the, in the long term and the future. Um, the transportation master plan, and, and I know that the council is probably tires of hearing us talk of, of the transportation master plan, but um, these tools and policies and the um, guidance that these documents provide will give us some of those tools to help facilitate those mode shifts. And many of those mode shifts are uh, uh, come about by restricting parking, um, making it more difficult to drive to the, to the hill and, and prioritizing transit service or active modes of trans transportation. Um, beyond the car and knowing that the community, at least at this point in time, I believe does not support expanding the road network to four lanes to the resort. Um, it's going to be absolutely critical that we um, find that mode shift and give, given the, the carrots and sticks to encourage that change in ridership. And so it's going to take some time, um, but it's the, it's, I think a very good vision for the future of the community to um, not dedicate more space to asphalt and roads, but to create the opportunity for people to get out of their car, go have a beer after skiing and get on the bus and go back to their hotel or come downtown for dinner. Um, I think it's a really good plan and, and, and um, now we have to, to be creative and succeed in implementing it. So it's gonna take some time again, but we're, we're starting down that path. And I'm very mm -hmm. pleased to see that we're here. And I hope council also is uh, supportive of, of the path we're trying to find for our future. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah this we'll is, come back to your council. It's on the same vein as, as your thoughts, uh, Councilor Elliott, but um, this is all really exciting to see this new uh, updated plan. And I'm curious, when in this discussion we should be talking about those incentives like free ridership for children or seniors or you know at what point um should we be having that discussion and also the timeline of this new plan what is this two questions uh, well the the uh, through your worship uh, to councillor rind um i would like to see us implement this as quickly as we can um, the combination of the systems. Um, the, the operating costs are going to come out of that combined system and the AOA that you see on a regular basis, on an annual basis, the operating agreement. Um, and then as we understand the, the implications of cost for O&M, for the new equipment, um, charging stations, et cetera, et cetera, um, Council will have every opportunity to help direct um, staff as to what things should be free and at what uh, what level, um, including children. Um, and we have, uh, in in conclusion, we have also prepared a letter to send to transit to say, hey, we're ready to start this process, and um, 
we'll see what all of the paperwork and the MOUs and agreements look like because I think this will be the one of the first combined systems like this. Um, uh, and so how it looks and what it looks like in the, we'll take some time to, to figure out. Yeah, just a follow-up comment. Um, it's just that, yeah, that, that, that sounds great. And I, uh, it would just be really exciting, I think, to have some big, even if it's not permanent, but at the beginning to change the habits and to encourage ridership, um, some incentives like a program where it's free for seniors or kids for the first year or whatever, um, just while that transition is happening. Councillor Elliott, I'll come back to you. Oh, uh, Jackie uh, mentioned the free ridership. Uh, I think that's been on, <laughs> been discussed many times. But uh, you know, the, the thinking uh, for me is that uh, if we can save money on roads uh, by less traffic and less paving, and uh, I'd put it into a transportation network that sort of moves people conveniently and uh, in comfort. Uh, I think those times, that type of thing, that that discussion can be had, you know, we can take money from one pot and put it into a, a green, uh, uh, you know, a, a convenient, a, a, a something that's good for our community. That's what we need to do. Uh, and I think we should be, be I'm all for it. So <laughs> I, can, I can say that. Seth? Seth, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to offer that um, that the BC government across the entire BC Transit network of systems offer, introduced a program just uh, about six months ago for free transit for children 12 and under. And so this is uh, offset with some provincial funding that the that the province sent out. And we had each uh, each local government sign a sign a letter saying I'm willing to take this money. And that money really at the end of the day more than offsets the costs to your, or the lost revenue from from children riding the bus. And so um, so we have that system and the province has indicated that they want to maintain that uh, into the long foreseeable long term uh, going forward because it's uh, been pretty widely acclaimed as a success, successful program. And it also uh, creates new riders at a young age. And so it becomes something that is uh, normalized mm -hmm. and not something unique. Councillor, any follow-up? Uh, I would, yeah, I, I agree. They under 12 uh, would be great. But I, I would suggest that <laughs> looking at the riders on our bus system currently, there are no, it's rare that anyone under 12 is on the thing. There, it, that's not saying never, but... Uh, the majority of our riders are not in that age group. And, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that the, <laughs> we've had a steady, uh, prior to COVID, we had a steady number on, on our transportation users, but I, I, I don't think it's a, a broad swath of our, our, our uh, population. It's a pretty narrow group that use it. So uh, I, I, I think that that's, if you want to reach a lot more people, you've got to make it easy to get on. You got to make it just just jump on, park my car, and I can save save some money. And it's just a simple process to go through. And not, I think it's just a uh, maybe it's a bit novel opening the door to everybody, but I think we can be novel. We can we can make we can define our we can design our own system. Councilor Carr, Mr. Black. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and to, to Councillor Elliott. We'll certainly consider um, the, this discussion in, in our future um, um, planning for, for uh, consolidating the systems and, and encouraging that uh, mode shift and increase in ridership. Um, as I said, I'm very excited to, to be able to state today that we're looking at combining the systems, and I'm very pleased that uh, our partners in crime in this uh, area, BC Transit and, and uh, everything, Revelstoke, their shuttle drivers are uh, also keen in seeing us succeed in this way. Uh, it's very nice to have a, a partnership in, in something like this. It's a big program, it's dynamic, and the um, opportunity is, is huge. Um, so I'm very pleased that, that we're here today um, and able to provide this um, updated document for your consideration. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions or concerns or comments from council? 
<laughs> Sorry, I have one more, Gary. Oh, so, so, yeah. uh, just on the school bus, has the school board been incorporated into your your, your discussions? Uh, we have a, a school board, a school bus fleet that continues to go roll through town as well. Uh, has that been absorbed into your into your into your evaluation? It has not, and um, my understanding is, and and I know um, operationally. Um, and, and perhaps I'm not the best one to answer this question, but my experience in other communities is that uh, um, except for high school students, um, typically all of the grade school, the middle school are always on their own bus systems mm -hmm. and the school has to maintain those uh, buses to a different standard. And so they have their own equipment and their own uh, mechanics for that very purpose. Um, now that doesn't mean that we can look at uh, in an, an opportunity there, or at least discuss that with the school district. But certainly, things that we can also ask and, and consider in our future planning. Mm -hmm. well, I just think in Vancouver or, or major centers, kids are on the bus uh, going to school. So I, I don't know if it's that much of a stretch to. Uh, I mean, certain areas need the, the you know way out there that come into our center would need a separate uh, uh, bus system, but. Uh, I don't know. It might be something to consider. Thank you. We will certainly take that into consideration. Right. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, thank you, Aaron and Seth. I appreciate you coming and doing the presentation. Much appreciated. Yeah. All right. We are going to move on to 9A, Transit Service Plan. So, Mr. Block, <laughs> how you are you deviating from our our presentation. I'm not, I, through your worship, um, the presentation that we just uh, walked through is basically a summary of the, uh, the long-term transit plan. And uh, should council have uh, any additional questions on the, uh, the report that um, Aaron uh, did a presentation on, I can certainly uh, provide some more answers and or Seth and or Aaron if uh, need be. Otherwise, um, I think we've had a, a pretty robust discussion on uh, during the presentation on this same report. Great, thank you. So I'll ask one last time, any other comments uh, from council? Seeing none, all right, we're gonna move on. Thank you, appreciate that. We're gonna move on now to item 9B. Uh, short-term rental draft policy. So, Mr. Simon, you're here. Um, Want to do a bit of a presentation before we uh, do a presentation to kind of bring council up to speed on this policy. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I can give a brief overview of the policy. Uh, essentially, this is a policy that staff are proposing to help guide the implementation of the recently adopted short-term rental zoning amendments, as well as the currently pending business license uh, MTI and fees and charges bylaw amendments. So in a nutshell, this policy is seeking to do three things, provide further guidance to staff for applications that are seeking to still go through the spot zoning process or for applications that are seeking to pursue a comprehensive development zone or propose a new standard zone to accommodate short-term rentals. Um, staff can't ultimately refuse to accept an application, but this would make very clear for applicants the, the idea that the city is not supportive of any further spot zoning applications at this time as we're trying to get a handle on short-term rentals and start commencing enforcement on illegal operations. It would also include provisions for um, when we would consider potential expansion of the area. So this has been a topic of discussion at the council table. And this basically would give direction to staff and it's important because it gives it to us in writing so that we have to follow up on it within 18 months from the adoption of this policy to ultimately bring a report back to council to give a, a status update. And I'm sure there will be reports before that, but this formalizes it to try and uh, explain to council and the community about how the short-term rental regulations are currently working, um, whether or not there's been any issues concerns with them, and if there's a need for any changes at that time, then staff would outline that in a report with associated recommendations. And then lastly, and importantly, to not only ensure a transparent and clear approach for the community, 
uh, with respect to enforcement, but also for staff and council to have that clear, consistent message, um, outlining the process at a, at a higher level that would be undertaken with respect to pursuing enforcement. So it reaffirms council's previous direction to pursue both a proactive and a reactive enforcement policy with respect to short-term rentals. Um, and it also includes some very specific de uh, dates in there. So up until July 31st, 2022, that would give us roughly a three month grace period for people to be uh, you know, informed of the new regulations, come in, ask development services, staff, any questions they have about how to come into compliance. Um, and this is important because it's something that's been communicated, I think throughout the short-term rental discussion that there was going to be this grace period for existing operators to explore opportunities on how they can come into compliance without seeing immediate ticketing uh, being the only option. And then after July 31st, this is when we would move into the standard um, enforcement approach where staff would basically be taking a, a two-pronged approach. The first step would be providing formal written notice for anyone who was operating a business without a valid business license. Um, and that would be used both, that would be done not only by uh, C-Click Fix for that reactive form of enforcement, but as well through the use of the software likely host compliance to cross-reference our business license database with the postings of short-term rentals uh, throughout the community to determine which ones are operating without a business license. So they would get the formal written notice, be given a specified time period to come in and apply for a business license. If they do not apply for a business license by that time, then the file would be passed to enforcement for further action, uh, which would include, but not be limited to issuance of tickets. And one of the key things that we've put in here, again, just to provide that greater clarity, is that should someone apply for a business license, as an example, someone applies for a bed and breakfast business license, staff determine you're actually looking to operate a short-term rental, you're not allowed to operate a short-term rental, and that business license is not issued. If they are still caught advertising after knowing that they are not permitted to operate that type of business, then staff would be able to skip that first step of issuing written notice and proceed directly to enforcement so that we have an expedited approach for those operators that are, uh, I guess, a little bit more challenging to be brought into compliance. So those are the three things that the policy is attempting to ultimately accomplish. And we are looking to ultimately have this in place to coincide with adoption and, and administration of the short-term rental policies, because we do anticipate, you know, as we start to roll this out, there will be those that will come in and seek to make applications for spot zoning. There will be those that are looking to submit applications immediately for bed and breakfast and other short-term rental uses as well. So it's really important that we have uh, some direction outlined that we can not only point to people, but staff can also use and rely upon to ultimately uh, enforce and administer the short-term rental regulations in a clear, consistent manner. Okay, thank you. So I, I have one question just to, Really, under the policy directive, so item number one about the resort fringe land use designation may be considered for rezoning. So, with the people that are in what we call that resort fringe now, are they allowed to operate short term rentals? Or I was understanding that kind of from uh, from Nickel Road South was a zone that basically was uh, open for short term rentals. Could you just clarify that for me, Mr. Sun? Most well, definitely to your worship and all of council. So the resort fringe land use designation uh, was recently adopted by council, uh, I believe it was bylaw 2298. And that gave a land use designation to the Thomas Brook community that previously had held the CSRD land use designation since the time it was incorporated into the city. And that land use designation uh, ingrains rights within the OCP that it may be supported to be used for tourist accommodation. Staff are currently working with uh, the first applicant on a zone that would be suitable under that uh, resort fringe land use designation to support different forms of tourist accommodation, one of them being short-term rental. So we just wanted to make clear in the policy that there wasn't any contradiction with that expectation that is ingrained in the development abilities under that resort fringe land use designation. All right, thank you. Any other comments from Council Councilor Ryan? Yeah, should spot zoning fees, do you think be, or rezoning, I suppose, fees be increased so that it um, is more of a deterrent to those people who, who want to do the spot zoning thing? 
Like, what are your thoughts on how we avoid getting into the same situation we were in in 2016? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Ryan, that's a that's a very good question. There's a couple key points I think that we need to consider, um, and planning and development services have, have had some chats with corporate services as well because when we got to craft bylaws, there's a lot of groups that start to get involved in it, and it does take staff time, like you're saying. So a couple of things that we need to ultimately consider is I think it's important that we have a clear policy and that council is is strong on not really supporting spot zoning applications that would undermine the the potential intent that we've tried to pass with the recent short-term rental amendments. And then secondly, as well, the way that staff kind of envision it is should someone want to make an application for spot zoning, we would bring the application immediately to council. That applicant would be able to provide a letter indicating why they believe that their application has merit and it should be brought forward. And we would be, staff essentially would recommend that the application be denied in accordance with council policy. And then if council saw fit to move the application forward, that's when we would start to move into drafting bylaws, preparing public hearings to minimize the impact on staff resources. Now that said, with respect to fees and charges, it would all be wrapped up under the current charge, which I believe is about $2,500 for rezoning, $2,000, somewhere in there. I think that if it was increased substantially and the process that staff are looking to administer to make it the least resource intensive process possible, um, I don't know if it would be necessary to increase the fees because again, we have to we have to do it on a cost recovery basis, right? So if we right. increase them too much as a deterrent, then we're getting away from that cost recovery discussion. So would they have to pay the fee just to have it come forward to council for that initial review? Uh, through your worship, yes, they would. They would okay. be they, they would need to submit a full rezoning application. <laughs> what we're trying to get away from is having substantial amounts of staff time dedicated to completing a full review, referring out these applications, having our corporate services team draft bylaws towards them and trying to find a, a clear, simplified manner of bringing them forward for council consideration early so that staff don't complete all the work only to have it you know, potentially denied at the end. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay, I have another question. So um, the... If, if I have suggestions for the operator guidebook, should I talk about those in this discussion? Uh, through your worship, the materials that we provided as the guidebook, um, you know, these are they're materials that staff would generally prepare kind of behind the scenes to help implement all this, not typically something that would go to council, but just because there's been so much discussion on short-term rental, we wanted to make clear to council that we were ready to implement this. And we also wanted to get it out in the public so that people can start to look at some of the information that will be relevant for their applications. I think if there's any feedback and um, your worship, you can correct me if I'm wrong or the corporate officer can, I think getting in touch with the city's corporate services group that can then relay that message to planning staff. Um, so I, again, we're always, we, we want to hear any suggestions you have to incorporate into those guidebooks. And if there's typos or anything in there, most definitely let us know and we can get all that fixed. But it, it's not really something that needs a council decision. So I think that right. there's different avenues by which we can get yeah. feedback and get embedded. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I guess it's more of a just staff document to help the public. Um, I just think there's a few like word choices that could be uh, substituted, but I'm happy to put that in an email and send it to staff. Uh, I had another question about the situation where you have a neighbor who's not happy with the next door neighbor. And let's just say that, for example, uh, there were a lot of in and out cars, but this person wasn't advertising on any sort of platform. Um, then in my understanding of this current rule, it would be a reactive process where the neighbor could submit a complaint. Um, but then like at, at what point like, how does staff handle that if they're just a bunch of complaints? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Ryan, that's a, that's a very good question. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing is if we have someone who's kind of flying under the radar and getting around all of our uh, technology and software programs we have to try and track and monitor this stuff, we get a C-click fix complaint saying, hey, this person's operating a business. They're not showing up on host compliance. Is, is that, am I kind of understanding the context yeah, totally. correctly? So yeah. in, in that situation, our bylaw enforcement group would, you know, begin an investigation to determine whether or not there is any illegal activity occurring there. 
one of the biggest things that we've been trying to promote from you know the planning and development services side in terms of compliance with bylaws is being open and accessible for the community and we really always advocate for trying to make initial contact should there ever be an issue that arises to not only understand both sides because we also understand and the bylaw enforcement officers can speak to this better than I can, but that sometimes there is a, a desire to pull city staff into potential neighbor disputes. And right. there may be situations where things are exaggerated on one side or the other. And it's, it's challenging for staff to obviously deal with those situations in a way that resolves it to the satisfaction of both parties. Um, but it would be something that would require further investigation and hopefully an opportunity for some education with both parties to make sure everyone's clear on what the bylaws are. And it's very important too that people understand just because you're not advertising your business, if you're operating a business without a business license, that's still a violation of the business license bylaw. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. I guess I'm just like that part you just mentioned about bylaws sort of roping in staff and it becoming this complicated process. I'm, I'm concerned that that might happen where there are these like neighborly disputes or if it's like someone new to town or whatever, and then they have like visitors that are just their friends, but then, you know, the neighborhood is like concerned that there's a short-term rental. It's like how far down that rabbit hole is that going to take staff to try and figure out, um, yeah. Or by law, I suppose. Yeah, I just, I, I, I know it's not a council issue, but if it, it ends up eating a lot of staff resourcing, then it, then it does become an issue for council. And through your worship, that's a good point. I know our bylaw group, they're pretty good at deciphering when something is uh, a valid concern or when it's not a valid concern. And that's why I think it's so important, um, you know, as we move to implement these short-term rental regulations, having clear, consistent communication between staff and council, to report back to indicate how this is going. Is it eating too much of staff's time? Do we need to have a discussion about resource and capacity and how we're administering these? It needs to be a, a fluent conversation where that type of data and information is, is freely exchanged back and forth. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions from council regarding the draft policy? Council Burks, I have a comment and a question. Uh, I'm, I'm supportive of this policy, I think it's, well drafted and well balanced. Uh, I had another comment, but I've forgotten it. But the question uh, for Mr. Simon, I'm just curious how, you know, are we getting a lot of people inquiring about business like business licenses and bed and breakfast? That's like a lot, a lot, or quite a bit, or? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Brooks Hill, we are getting uh, several inquiries about it. People are obviously interested and, and concerned about how it potentially impacts them. We've begun the process of reaching out to everyone who has an application uh, for spot zoning that's on hold to get their desires, how they want to move forward with their application. So it is something that is, uh, you know, taking up a little bit of time and staff do expect that, you know, this isn't something that's going to be cleaned up within a month or two months, it's going to be a multi-month process to not only educate the public, educate operators, um, but also, you know, get the software and start to follow up with everyone that doesn't have a valid business license. So we are seeing a little bit of an uptick in inquiries. We anticipate that to continue to increase. I think that we will get to the point, staff hope sooner rather than later, that it will plateau. And then we start to get a handle on the, on the problem and start to solve some of those problems. And then it starts to dip down and it takes up less and less staff time. And our conversations with other municipalities, implementing the regulations, you usually get a spike of inquiries, applications, licenses. There's a, a learning curve that you have to go through for the, both the public and staff to administer the new regulations. Um, but then it does ultimately plateau and drop off once we get a handle on it. So that's what we're hoping the case is. But again, this comes back to having that clear communication between staff and council. And if it's something where our bylaw enforcement group, for instance, is completely overwhelmed with illegal operators, it's really important in my view that staff are communicating that to council so that we're, we're staffed up accordingly and resourced accordingly and look at what options we have for that. All right, thank you, Councilman. Um, on Tuesday, we discussed briefly uh, the fee for bed and breakfast, which is $50. Uh, and the proposed short-term rental fee, which is 500. Um, can we 
discuss that here like when yeah we're going into another council meeting after this and oh. that's on the agenda okay never mind all right any other comments uh regarding this policy councillor elliott uh, maybe I'm, I'm just looking for a bit of background now we have roughly 70 official vacation rentals that, that would through the spot zoning process is that right or, uh, three, yeah go ahead through your worship i believe there's about 40 and then we have 11 on hold i'd have to double check the numbers i know they're in one of the previous staff reports so, so that was through the uh, previous system where they would spot uh, spot zone application they have to go through that process and then there's two or 300 at the resort in that resort fringe area. Is that what I understand? Uh, at the resort, they have, I'm trying to recall exactly how many they have at the Sutton place and then Monashi and Mackenzie, um, yeah. well over a hundred. And then with Mackenzie village, 46 units in phase one, 121 in phase two and three. I believe the numbers in the staff report from January showed um, units that were either constructed or in the process of securing approvals to be constructed, about 530 um, would be viable legal short-term rental businesses. And when we are looking during peak season, we're hitting that 270 to 300 uh, short-term rentals are being advertised right now. And then the Thomas Brook area, that's another group uh, of homes that are eligible for short-term rentals. Cor correct. That would be 23 properties. Okay. Okay. So, 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 and, and those entities, uh, if there's a complaint or if there's a problem, what is, what is the stick that we have? <laughs> we, do, do we have any way to enforce, uh, if there's a problem, you lose your license or, or, or how does that, what do we have uh, in, in place and what do we hope to put in place? Uh, through your worship, the municipal ticketing information bylaw is very important. Uh, it's a very important piece of this. And Again, with the bylaw enforcement group, and I, I won't speak too much about how they do their job. You know, the city, um, you know, ticketing is is not often the the first approach, depending on the severity of the situation. But it's an important tool to have. And the way that the MTI bylaw needs to be crafted is to ensure that each uh, offense is a separate offense and a separate ticketable offense, so that it could be a fine of five hundred to a thousand dollars per offense per day that the offense continues. And to have that big stick doesn't mean you have to use it 100% of the time, but to be able to say to an operator, we've counted five violations of our business license and zoning bylaw regulations upon initial review. And that equates to a fine of $5,000 per day that the offenses continue. Then you start to see someone you know, pretty quickly wanting to come into compliance when they realize after three or four days, they're gonna be looking at a, a maximum of a 15 or $20,000 fine. So that's a very important piece to this. And the MTI bylaw did receive second reading on Tuesday. And uh, I know there will be a discussion after um, the committee of the whole today in the council meeting to consider a third reading for it. So staff are confident that we have enough leverage to make the potential penalties outweigh the benefits of operating a short-term rental illegally. Um, but that is a very important piece to the puzzle. Follow up, Councillor. Uh, and just on, on the new spot zoning uh, entities that are interested, so we'd have to go through a rezoning process for those uh, those 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 concerns. Uh, through your worship, yes. If you are not located within an area where you are permitted to operate a short-term rental, so if you're in Columbia Park and you're zoned R2 and you want to operate a short-term rental, the only option you would have is to go through the spot zoning process, which again, it's very important in this policy that we make clear that we're, we're not supportive of that right now. Um, it not only helps expedite things for staff, but it makes it very, very clear to, to the community and applicants. I'm sure there will be some situations where, you know, council could deem it to have merit, but it's, it's important for staff that we don't have, um, you know, I, I know when the spot zoning process was going strong, I think they were dealing with 65 rezoning applications a year coming in, which is quite a drain on staff time. Mm -hmm. But it, when we do say in 18 months, when we're opening the door for new people or we're going to reevaluate our, our bylaw, we still have, would we amend the uh, rezoning application fee? I mean, you, you suggested three, $4,000 might be a, a target for a rezoning application. Um, or two, three thousand dollars for a rezoning application. Uh, 
what about in 18 months time? Are we going to reconsider, look at that as a, as a, I mean, I'm trying to make some equity in the community. So people have already got, you know, the pathway through without paying any significant fee. Anyone else has to pay that fee. So I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're considering that. Uh, most definitely. And through your worship, I think that the discussion of the fees and charges for rezoning applications in general is something that, that will have to come to the forefront at some point in time. Right now, our current fees, in my, uh, in my professional opinion, are, are quite low compared to the staff time that it takes to get a rezoning application through the process, um, especially when we start getting into complex rezoning applications. But I think that that's a, that's a broader discussion as part of future fees and charges bylaw amendments to ensure that the charges that we're, um, we're putting in our fees and charges bylaw are reflective of cost recovery principles. Yeah, it just it's a, it's a burden on the future guys, not the guys that are currently uh, uh, allowed to do it. Uh, uh, and then one more question: uh, when when we uh, one of the when we had our public forum, I think uh, one suggestion that came up was about a, like a, once you have your approval for the uh, short term rentals, it wasn't uh, in perpetuity. Like a, it, uh, like a three year term was suggested, or, or a couple of options on, on a narrow window when you could have this license or eligible for the license. And then you had to reapply down the road if, if after a three-year term or after a certain term, you would reopen the, the, the dialogue. Uh, I'm just wondering if that's something we should be looking at as well. Uh, so through your worship, uh, business licenses need to be renewed annually. So they do have to come in and make a renewal application every year. But I, I think if I'm recalling correctly, what you're referring to is this discussion of temporary use permits which is how some municipalities have tried to deal with the short-term rental issue where you can apply for a temporary use permit for a period of three years, and then it can be renewed for another period of three years. And then after that process is done, you may apply for a permanent zone change to accommodate that use. Um, there are some municipalities that have gone that road. That's the approach that they take for the comprehensive management of short-term rentals. Whereas our approach was you know, a little bit different where we said what areas are suitable for this use let's allow it as a use in those areas and try to get a handle on it and, and stop um, allowing it to be dispersed throughout the community and let's try and centralize it adjacent to resort operations and, and other existing areas like McKenzie Village that permit short-term rentals. So I think that's a separate conversation, putting term limits on it. Well, I, I think it was more uh, in a neighborhood that's allowable, say the resort fringe. Uh, one house has got the vacation rental and he's got the license for it and uh, the next door neighbor is equal, equal to it, but he hasn't got a license. Does he, yeah, you know, what are his options? If, he, if the street then becomes a, a, a continuum of vacation rentals, we're talking neighborhood, sort of a, a different neighborhood. But I mean, having someone have it for three years and then it goes to an open competition, you, the next person might have the opportunity to, to take on the, on the license for that. You know, rather than have 10, vacation homes on the street, you, can have, you might limit it to one or two. Uh, through your worship, that does start to become a bit of a, a challenging process to administer. Um, you know, the way that we've approached this is trying to make it a little bit more simple where you got to be zoned to permit the use. And if you're not zoned to permit the use, then, you know, here's an option. You can go through a spot zoning process. Um, but I think what you're referring to is um, what Councilor Ryan had brought up at one of the meetings about regulating it based on a maximum number per block, yeah. which is, a, it's a, that's a bit of a different conversation, I think. And, and that's something that would have had to be considered as part of zoning amendments to be, uh, you know, regulated through that manner. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Councilor Ryan, you have another question? Yeah, there's one last one about um, a situation I'm sure you've already thought about, <laughs> Paul, but, um, or sorry, Mr. Simon. <laughs> um, so let's say there was a, vacation rental company and they had a bunch of properties that operate short-term rentals and they rent them out for the season like with some long-term agreement and then they go off and find short-term stays for properties then how does that work because they're like well i'm only renting it to so and so vacation rental properties how can you like like how does the city, what is the recourse there to make sure that that doesn't happen? So through your worship to Councilor Ryan, just so I'm understanding the question correctly, if someone um, 
is trying to say that I'm renting it to a vacation rental company. And then that vacation rental company is almost subleasing it to different yes. tenants that are yes, coming. Exactly. Through. So uh-huh. I, again, we would look back to intent, right? Okay. So your intent is to operate it on a short-term basis and the occupants are coming in for a period of less than 30 days. It's a short-term rental and you need to abide by the regulations. Some of the regulations, depending on what your zoning is, require permanent resident on-site operator. Some of them allow whole, whole home rentals with 24-7 property management services. Um, they would still be subject to the same rules and regulations. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments, Council Palmer? Uh, thank you, Mayor Souls. Um, uh, my first question, I guess, is on, I'll go on the enforcement stuff. So the complaint-based part of the policy, um, and I know this went through council already, so that's the, uh, the uh, reactive approach to enforcement. And I guess my concern with that is um, just how big that could be and just the complexity. Um, I'm wondering, I guess, more for council, whether, you know, there might be a, I, my, my preference would be that it'd be more focused so that's not just on the complaint basis, because I could just see that it'd be just an overwhelming thing and, uh, and then we lose the focus, focused in, enforcement, uh, that um, proactive approach. So that's, I guess, one concern I have. I don't know if there's an answer, Paul or Mr. Simon. We've talked about that a little bit before, and uh, it's one that I have concern because we uh, that could have budget implications as to just capacity the bottom line. Do you want an answer for that before you carry on? Uh, it, I think it's just a statement. Oh. I think, yeah, more than anything. Um, I, I'm thinking in t- it's probably more of a question for council as a policy item uh, where, where that goes. Uh, the second is on the, my next question or comment question. Yeah, it's not a question. It's a position, I guess, is on the uh, timelines of the grace period. You have July 31st, 2022, approximately three months. Um, uh, assuming this gets through this, this, uh, in April. Um, so I guess through to council, I'm thinking that a six month period is probably more appropriate. This is pretty, uh, it's aggressive and maybe it needs to be aggressive, but I, again, sort of the capacity thing and sort of getting our ducks together. I, I, my inclination is that that would be, uh, October 30th. Um, so that's a comment, I guess. Um, now. The next one, I guess, is maybe a little bit more of a question because maybe, uh, Mr. Simon, it's in the policy again. Number seven is you have that date, July 31st, of the education-based approach. Number eight, it says enforcement, but there's a, a formal written notice in a specified period, which is not specified in the policy. And so maybe I'm going to be contradicting myself a little bit on that longer period, because if it was specified, uh, because it's, it's sort of a stepping stone, I guess. So there's this very non-enforcement uh, process for the three months in the proposed policy. And then it goes into this next thing, well, we're going to give you a letter warning that you have in whatever that specified period, which is not specified, it, it, it maybe it's a, a thought about that as, as a policy item is specifying that they're given three months as of the written notification for enforcement. And that might capture my concerns on the, the other piece. So yeah. can, I, can I ask Mr. Simon for comment on that, sure. Councillor? Yeah. So uh, just, just any comment on that, Mr. Simon, regarding if we stayed with the same date of, of July 31st, and then we actually put in that uh, period of time where people had, uh, they got their, their warning, they have to comply within three months. Are we overstating that time period, or is that going to be something uh, maybe a prudent choice for people to be able to come into compliance, but also give a bit of time for bylaw and for planning. Can you make comment on that, please? Uh, through your worship uh, to all of council, I guess, 
if there is a, a desire of council to extend the grace period from July 31st to October 31st, that is most definitely a, a decision that council could make. And it's a pretty easy amendment to the policy. With respect to that date that's currently written after August 1st, here's the process. That would be the process that would guide us into the foreseeable future. Um, from staff's perspective, if the if council's desires to put a specified period in there, I think three months is too long. I think it's really important that we would tighten that up as much as possible and give people, you know, what we would envision as probably a maximum of two to three weeks, something within that window. Because again, what we're asking is that people come in and apply for a license. Once you apply for a license, you start to fall within that area that you're being brought into compliance. Compliance isn't something that you know, can generally happen overnight. It can be a process that you need to go through. We'll have individuals that will apply for a business license. Um, and then upon inspection from the city may require a building permit to do some renovations, right? So, so it will be a process of being brought into compliance. So if, there, if council's desire is to extend that, that grace period, uh, my recommendation would be that it's on the front end of the process to have that education-based period be a little bit longer. Um, our concern from staff side of six months is that we're starting to get into busy peak tourist time by the end of October into November, December. And we'd really, really like to have a handle on this as much as possible and start getting the word out uh, as soon as possible and using host compliance to start to flag those properties that are non-compliant so that the workload is uh, hopefully diminished once we get into peak ski season next year. Um, but most definitely my, my, my opinion would be that if we're going to extend it, I think extending it on the front end rather than the back end is most appropriate. And thank you for that comment. So, Councillor Palmer, I'll come back to you. Um, do you want to make that recommendation uh, with this policy at this point? Um, I, I just wanted to raise raise the thing because okay. I think it's a fairly easy thing, and you know, maybe other councillors have a position on this point, but I'm not adamant. It's just a, a okay. All right, thank you. Um, so, my next um, uh, question, somewhat unrelated, but it's it's related to this whole. Uh, vacation rental suite thing. So I've asked this question before, but I'm going to ask it again. In order to have a vacation rental under the bylaw, you first need to have a suite. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Palmer, it depends. Depends on what your zoning is. And this is the challenge that we've had, I think, throughout the process is between all of the CD zones that permit short-term rental, between the spot zone properties, expanding it to the downtown and expanding it to um, you know, this, these 59 properties along Hay Road, the rules are slightly different, which is why in those supporting documents that staff had provided on Tuesday, you'll see in the, I believe it's in the fact sheet, there's a table in there that basically says, if you're zoned this, here's what your short-term rental rules are. So there are zones that permit whole home rentals, and then there are zones where you need to be a permanent resident on-site operator where that secondary suite is mandatory. Right. Um, thank you, that's helpful. Um, one, of, one of the, you know, it was difficult for council to finally come to a position of getting the, the bylaw in place. And one of the challenges was weighing out the need of vacation rentals for various reasons. Uh, as opposed to, uh, and one of the issues was on um, long-term rentals, so suites that uh, that are for workers or whatever people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in the in the vacation, if a person has a vacation rental license in a a building, a dwelling that required the um, a suite, a secondary suite. So, in that particular situation. Will the, will the person be able to use, to choose a vacation rental or long-term rental or a combination of both? Mr. Simon? Uh, through your worship, just so I'm understanding the question correctly, if someone has a, a single family dwelling with a secondary suite and they're zoned for short-term rental, um, yes. are they able to alternate back and forth if they say, okay, I'm operating a, a short-term rental for a little bit? Ah, uh, you know what? Not working out too well. I want to transition to a long-term renter. Are they able to do that? Yeah, that's that. That's part of the question, anyway. Yes. Uh, through your worship, yes, they are able to do that. They would just need an update to their business license. Okay, and then this is 
uh, these are leading questions to more into the policy. Uh, the for those areas that you have a, a secondary suite that is not permitted a vacation rental, um, but you're allowed to have a secondary suite, so that's month by month rentals. Um, are they required to have a business license? Uh, through your worship, yes, they're required to have a, um, a secondary suite business license. Okay, so in that case, um, again, it's related to the policy. So in the case where they're not allowed a vacation rental, but they're allowed month by month, they have a business license, they advertise on one of the platforms and it's clear the intent and the advertising is for a month by month rental, then they are able to do that. Uh, through your worship, yes. You're able to advertise on, a, on an online platform uh, for long-term rental. You do see people doing that. I would say it's not as frequent as the short-term rental. The platforms really are built for short-term rentals, but it is something that someone can do. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, so I, I think it's a, mind you, it's, if, I think that's fine. It's, it's captured in the, uh, the policy and, the, and that's good. The, so the final thing that I have is on the spot zoning. So I'm, I'll just say that I'm a little bit hesitant on the, uh, on the, uh, the getting to the, the policy level where we actually are prohibiting, um, or by policy, strongly discouraging a spot zoning. Um, and so in the policy portion, um, you have uh, this area of the backlog of, of spot zones. We get those addressed. We finalize that. The question, and it's more for council. So the question is, on those existing long-term well-run vacation rentals that are non-compliant and not permitted under the, the new laws, what do we do with those? Because I, in, I'm concerned about shutting down well-run vacation rentals uh, that meet a need in the community. And the spot zoning is a possible, still a possible method for dealing those one-off exceptional or different situations, special situations. And so that's probably the biggest hesitation. I don't think I need to go into debate. I'm just expressing a concern on the policy side. So any comment, Councilor Rose? Yeah, maybe you should have thought of that before voting in favor of this uh, proposal. But I think what Mr. Simon's comment about um, the preliminary process, having all those applications come forward before having to do a full spot zoning probably meets that concern because we'll not will, but council, any council of the day will have the opportunity to look on it case by case basis and determine if it is properly run and if there are concerns or if it's in a good area, then maybe that that's part of the applicant's sort of story. You know what I mean? Like when they come forward with that application, that's part of it. So through the mayor to Councilor Ryan, so on like when I look at this policy, it's just those existing ones, the ones that already have their permit in place. Right. So are you suggesting that maybe- those, The spot zoning ones, that those are grandfathered in though, I thought. No, these, these are the spot zones that have a part. The 11 applications are just like two. Oh yeah, totally. So should we be allowing others to spot zone at this time or not in your opinion? In my opinion, it doesn't fit with the bylaw that was passed, so no. So, and then, and I would argue that it fits within the bylaw of spot zoning. And it, this is a policy thing that's starting to override. So that, that tool already exists. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting perspective. Sure. Um, um, do, you, do you mind if I weigh in? Yeah. Do you mind if I Council Brooks, do you comment? Um, I, my only comment is that I have a similar request. <laughs> How is that good? Okay, so when we, when we just look at the wording here, applications to spot zone uh, to allow for short-term rentals within residential buildings will not be supported to ensure residential housing stock is preserved for permanent residents. So that goes forward, and basically that's a comment that staff stay to the applicant 
and then it can still come to council for council to override that. Is that correct, Mr. Simon, or can you just give clarification on that, please? Uh, through your worship, that is correct. The council policy does help give direction to staff. Council is not bound to follow the policy. Um, it would be staff's preference, obviously, if this policy is upheld to the best of its ability to ensure, you know, to be very frank with, and everyone knows it, we're, we're in a serious housing crunch right now. Three years from now, we'll be in a bit of a different position. Um, and something to keep in mind too, we did have Mackenzie Village they're well underway with their construction. That'll be 121 units by the time everything's up and running that are eligible to be used as a vacation rental. So, um, you know, from a planning perspective, I don't know if we're gonna be in a shortage of availability for different vacation rental units, given the fact that we've already had pretty, uh, I would say, you know, we've had pretty lax zoning regulations to allow for it throughout the city. There's a lot of properties that are zoned for it. And we are at the point now where we really need to start looking at housing stock for permanent residents because there is a severe shortage of rental housing stock. Great, thanks for your comment. So, uh, Councillor Palmer, any comment after hearing those words? Yeah. So, so from my perspective, so policy item number two, mm -hmm. um, uh, to me, it's too strong because it's saying that uh, applications to spot zone to allow for short-term rentals within residential buildings will not be supported. It's talking about housing stock. Um, and so for those non-compliant that are already running, I'm, I question the wisdom of that because there are, it's- I So you wanna change one word? I, my, ideally, I would probably strike out all, um, all of number two, but I, I think because this is at the committee, the whole level, there might be opportunity later on. We could talk about it more right now, but I haven't come up with a specific wording, but that's, I just wanted to have that. You can take out the word will and put in the word may. That's good. I, I like that. For, that's, a, that's a simple one. It doesn't give clear direction to staff. It's really kind of muddles the water, but it gives that opportunity for, um, you know, clear, concise saying, we can't guarantee that council is going to allow your application to go forward, but it's possible. So, Councillor Charlotte, you have your hand up. Comment. Thank you, Worship. Um, I don't think I agree with the with softening this wording. I think clear is kind in this case, and this is a staff policy, not a council policy, as was explained by staff. In my mind, having clear and honestly kind wording in the policy to say that this will not be supported at this time. Uh, if there are further suggestions on wording and what that could look like, I think that would be more appropriate to come out of the housing action plan to have some wording with maybe something around a sunset clause where we will revisit this. Um, but with the talk of the report coming back to council in 18 months uh, to look at those stats and to reassess, um, I think building in that feedback loop would be sufficient to adjust any of that wording, but to put in maybes in staff policies, I don't think it's going to be helpful for anyone. Okay, thanks for the comment, Councilor Palmer. Um, so, uh, further to Councilor Sherlatt, or just to affirming on the wording, so a may is, is provides ambiguity in, in just for clarity, it is a this is a council policy to provide clarity to staff. So may uh, stops that clarity to staff, but it's definitely this is a council policy for, right. and and so the problem with the may word is planning says well what do we do with that kind of thing. So they want clarity, um, and I, I, you know this will come back to council anyway. But I'm I'm almost. I'm wondering about capturing, and it might be a whole other policy line on um, on those exceptions of long term or short term rentals that make sense that should be enabled to to perhaps should be uh, enabled uh, a spot zoning. So I'll think that through, unless there's other things that council wants to say. Yeah, Councilor Shirley, I see your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Go for Thank it. you. Um, yes, well, there's, there's two documents that will be coming forward in the coming months uh, and maybe years. Um, I'm not sure the timeline and the destination management plan for tourism. 
but the more robust and comprehensive destination management plan, in my mind, could look at addressing the visitor needs, and then the housing action plan would be looking at the resident needs. So having those documents come forward, then ideally the destination management plan would identify any gaps in the service delivery of short-term and tourism accommodation. Um, so if there were something like an accessibility request where if there were homes that were accessible to those with mobility issues um, that were suitable for spot zoning for short-term rentals, I could see that being a reasonable request. Um, but to have those those boundaries and those needs identified through those planning documents, I think is going to be the powerful route to making sure that that policy is well guided, that's actually serving needs that are identifiable and measurable. Okay, thank you for the comment. And, and so I will go back to the original wording. And as Mr. Simon said, that doesn't, uh, doesn't stop people from making the application if they feel that they have uh, a valid uh, reason for making that application. It may not be supported by staff. We've seen that many times come to this table. And so that still gives people the opportunity to do it if that's their desire. And I just make that just for a common uh, uh, comment. Go ahead, Councillor Elliott. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I think it will be difficult uh, to, if the process is known that you come in, you have an existing vacation rental, you come in, you'll get the no from the uh, planning department because it's not in the existing 59 homes. And then you say your option is to go to council. It sort of undermines their, <laughs> their, their authority and uh, it's kind of a weird place to be, I would think. Um, but uh, and, and having gone through this before, where we've had you know sixty plus public hearings in a year yeah. on previous council, it gets to the point where you know let's just put it in abeyance and we'll talk about it later. We can't do that. There has to be some defined decisions made. So um, that's you know, what I'm saying, Gary. It just becomes a, it'll, and then it becomes a council problem. So we get there and say. Do we like this proposal or not? And we're, we're you know, every different uh, entity that comes in, we'll have to evaluate. So it just adds a significant level of work to our, our, our itinerary. Uh, but, but just on the real question is, uh, is there any indication of the number of, uh, you said there were 11 pending spot zoning uh, issues. How many people are operating outside of that? Okay, with total understanding, Mr. Simon, the numbers of uh, short term rentals that are not compliant. Through your worship, Councillor Elliott, the last review we did showed about 270, 280 to 300 properties that were operating and advertising. And we have uh, currently, I believe, 50 valid business licenses that were issued. So it will be, it will be quite a cleanup. And um, from staff's perspective, there is definitely a concern that if we don't have strict and clear policy with very clear language embedded in it, that we will see a major influx of these applications that will um, detract from staff time on other projects. Yes, thank you for that. And follow up, Councillor Elliott. <laughs> wow, I think there are going to be a lot of upset people. Eh? I, <laughs> I have a suspicion, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> thank right. you. All right, good. Any other comments from council? So we've got one councillors just left the room for just a moment. Uh, so my question to you, is there any appetite to put a motion on the table to move this short-term rental draft policy to, uh, to the council table? And so if so, someone want to make a motion and then we can uh, see if there's a seconder. So, uh, Councillor Sherlett, you're wanting to make that motion, is that correct? Okay, followed, uh, seconded by Councillor Brooks Hill. So, the motion on the table is to move this short term rental draft policy from Committee of the Whole to uh, the Council table. And um, I can actually bring that up in. Uh, probably 20 minutes in uh, the council meeting and see if there's any appetite to discuss it or to uh, put it off to another council meeting. Mr. Simon, any comment on that? I didn't ask you that. I just kind of thrown out the, uh, 
the uh, premise. So, statement from you, sir. Uh, through your worship, nothing to add on. Again, staff's desire is to see all of this wrapped up in a nice, tidy package. So all the bylaws, those three supporting bylaws that council will subsequently consider would be adopted concurrently with the policy pending uh, direction and any uh, recommendations for changes from council. All right. So the motion on the table is to move the draft policy to, uh, to council. And uh, any comments on that? Councilor Palmer, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to put an amend, amendment since we talked about the date. So on uh, uh, to amend that motion, it's a little bit tricky here just because it's, I'm uh, just going back to that date on uh, uh, number seven. Okay. Uh, to get that to October 30th, but we maybe can do that after. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So that policy, when it goes to council, that uh, date of implementation can now be changed uh, at in council. Is that correct, Mr. Simon? Uh, through your worship, unless I hear differently from the corporate officer, I believe that there wouldn't be any issues if uh, if council wanted to make a resolution to make that change and then adopt the policy after. Okay, so Ms. Floyd, comment? Uh, that would be fine, your worship. Um, we can make those amendments in the council meeting following this. All right, you're okay that council member. Uh, yeah, but that, that's fine, although it might be <laughs> your way. So I'm just wondering from other council members on the, the date of changing that to uh, July, or the July 31st on number seven to October 30th, 2022. And that also results in number eight being changed to uh, November 1st, 2022. I'm just wondering if any council members have any concerns with that kind of change. Councilor Sherlock has her hand up and Councilor Ryan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I kind of liked the middle of, or the end of July date, just because it's the middle of the summer. So it gives time to show, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure how many are operate, very operational during the summertime, but there is a good solid summer season in Revelstoke. Uh, so it would allow staff to be able to start moving into that enforcement during a slower season for tourism to start the ball rolling and deal with any hiccups and get that going smoothly before the fall season hits. Um, by the end of October, November 1st, now we're getting into the peak seat as uh, staff was reporting earlier, as we start getting into that heavier ski season um, to deal with enforcement, starting enforcement at that point, I could see being less smooth um, for both the staff, but also for the user experience, the citizen experience. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Ryan. Yeah, I agree. I think we should leave it the way it was originally um, put in the uh, proposed by staff. I feel like they have a good plan and um, we'll be able to carry it out. I think people have been also watching this for a while now and those who are affected know about that. Um, so even though it might be kind of intense, there'll be a lot of like similar responses, most likely going out to a lot of those proponents. And yeah, I think it's time that we Take action. Okay, so any further comments uh, on the motion on the table, Councillor Ellie? Just, uh, I'm not quite sure how, how you see uh, July is the off season and not October. Uh, Nicole, uh, I, I mean, October, it would be uh, more the off season and a month, uh, you know, like basically do, implementing this thing in the middle of summer <laughs> is a bit upsetting to many who are just, uh, making it work as it is. So uh, I'm just wondering what you're thinking of. Um, by October, end of October, housing is already becoming an, well becoming an issue. People are starting to rent long-term rentals by September to get into the ski season. The ski season doesn't really pick up till Christmas, but the rental situation does pick up a little bit earlier. Um, the to delay enforcement to adopt these bylaws now and to delay enforcement until after a full summer season to me is a carte blanche to well you may as well just run it over the summer because you're not going to get a ticket it'll just be educational for the whole season whereas starting the enforcement like moving the enforcement into the next phase halfway through the season gives that opportunity for education for an honest mistake but then we move smoothly into enforcement and having a clear stated bylaw that we are using uh, after so many years of not enforcing this. 
So is it more sense to, to say October 1 and to complete off season and then uh, uh, actual enforcement November 1? I think I mean, she just whoops. answered your question. She already answered your question. She's comfortable with the end of August. Or okay, the well then I disagree with it, sir. Okay, that's fine. I'm not there. I'm just saying she's just answered your question, Councillor. I'm not trying to debate you. All right. Um, so there is a motion on the table to just promote this to council. And then if you want to have further debate on dates and whatnot, that can happen. So any further comment on the motion on the table? Seeing none, I'll call a question. All those in favor? Opposed. So note that Councillor Elliott and Councillor Ryan are opposed to going to council. This motion has been moved to council. It's passed. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to 10A, annual report from the fire department. Chief DeRossi, you have the presentation for us. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have a... Uh... Uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I will share my screen with you for the uh, annual report, and I can speak to that briefly. And you should be able to see my screen. You can, thank you. Excellent. So I just wanted to highlight a few things for you uh, for the state of the Revelstoke Fire Department for 2021. Um, the uh, combination fire department model worked very well. Uh, it uh, supports up to 36 volunteer firefighters with the career firefighters. And one of the things that we'd like to say is that our capabilities are growing each year, uh, hopefully meeting uh, or exceeding those of the community's needs. And so I just wanted to highlight a few things for you uh, from last year. Uh, and mostly due to uh, a lot of people moving around as you know, there's lots of people coming and going. So in uh, 2021, we had five new members come on to the volunteer ranks. Um, so that was a good thing. Unfortunately, with those uh, new recruits comes along with some resignations. So we lost three. And I wanted to thank those three for their years of service. As you recall, in the fall of uh, 2021, we did a recruitment drive where we gained uh, 60 plus applications, uh, having accepted 14 new recruits into the 2022. So that's the, uh, by my math, I think we're up about seven volunteers. So it's a bit of a revolving door there. On the uh, career side of things, uh, we did hire uh, one volunteer uh, firefighter into the career ranks, and that was to cover the parental leave. Uh, he is doing uh, quite well and has fit in very well. He's just passed his probation for six months. And um, we did purchase a number of equipment. Uh, let's see, we got the quick attack monitor there and those are uh, a large volume nozzle that is capable of being manned or staffed by one firefighter to allow for a greater efficiency and effectiveness of our crew and resources. We did install a uh, fragmentation containment uh, container for the uh, self-contained breathing apparatus fill station. So it's a high pressure filling station. So if we had an air cylinder fail during filling, the explosion would be contained within that fragmentation container. For our incidents uh, in 2021, we had 370. Uh, draw your attention to the top right of the screen there from 2017 to 2021. Our call ratios uh, have been dropping, which is very interesting, but I'm sure when we look in the, the future that 2020 and 2021 will have been highly affected by uh, the COVID pandemic. In the bottom right uh, corner there, we've got our percentages of our call ratios. So how much of our response is put into each of those different types of, of calls. There's the fire alarms is by far the largest, followed by medical response, uh, followed by MVIs. Public safety and education. Um, 375 inspections were done in 2021 and the graph on the center right 
shows the five-year trend on inspections. So inspections are increasing every year and that's due to the new builds and community growth and also occupancy changes from a building may change from a residential to a commercial which would then facilitate requirements for fire inspections and the property losses um, interestingly went quite uh, low in 2019 we had very few losses in 2019 and they spiked again just under a million dollars for 2020 and 2021 respectively the value of the properties at risk uh, 16 million dollars plus and so firefighters effectively saved about 15 and a half million dollars worth of property value Training is ongoing. Um, every year we do a lot of different uh, types of training, but primarily our biggest focus is training the new recruits to become effective and efficient firefighters. It takes about three years for that to truly happen. The first year is very, very busy with the NFPA 1001 firefighter training. And then they spend the next couple of years adding on a number of additional skills and capabilities and competencies. And of course, the community events, we have the, uh, the fundraising. And in 2021, the firefighters raised over $8,500 for both the BC Burn Fund and the Muscular Dystrophy Canada Fund. And so they split that up uh, equally between the two charities and made those donations. So that was very good. Something that the community may not know is that our fire department also uh, has uh, four certified child passenger seat educators, child passenger safety educators. I always get that one mixed up. Um, so if uh, people need to uh, make sure that their child passenger seat is properly installed, <laughs> uh, they can call in and make an appointment to uh, have it checked. And also they will help them uh, if they need to move it from vehicle to vehicle, help them understand how to safely and properly install it. And so for going into 2022, uh, the fire department is uh, is well staffed and and very strong and hopefully getting stronger. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chief. I much appreciate the presentation and uh, and what your staff's doing for the community. Uh, these little things, uh, you know, like the child care uh, seat safety checks, uh, little to most of us who don't have kids that age, big thing for the parents. So appreciate the fact. That Absolutely. We are able to do that and uh, you know and your contributions to the community for the fight uh, for the burn fund that sort of things and important the cool thing or the great thing for us is to see that we've got volunteers who want to work and are coming on stream so appreciate that thank you for that council any comments or questions for chief DeRosa? same none thank you uh, chief appreciate it thanks again you're welcome all right thank you we're going to move on to uh, Parks and Rec first quarter report. Any comments uh, regarding that? I don't see uh, Ms. Donato here, uh, but any comments or questions from uh, Council? Councillor Brooks? Uh, it's just nice to see things getting busier, programs running again. Yeah, more yeah. people in the pool and facilities being used. It's great to see that, you know, one of the things that we, along with, you know, most other businesses in the community are having a hard time getting staff, and uh, so you know, this weekend we close tomorrow and close on Sunday because of staff. So, uh, Councilor Palmer? Yeah, they, one thing I, or sort of question that I had from the report, and it's not an important question as far as getting an answer, but uh, in 2022 or uh, featuring count is still down, and I'm the previous year it was COVID, but 2022, I think it's more to do with staff and so people yeah. it's not open. So our patron count is now not because of COVID fears, it's because we don't have staff. That, that's exactly it. Yeah. Well, there were limitations on numbers as well in January. Half of February, yeah, for a portion of yeah, yeah, yeah. Staff and stuff. But, but but even before that, we were reducing hours, so yeah, yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the combination, yeah. 
All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, terminate this committee of home meeting. Councilor Palmer, second by Councilor Ryan. All in favor? Motion's carried. We're going to take a few minute break before we go to the council. So, Ms. Floyd, do I need?